Okay, welcome all. Good afternoon. Um, welcome to the labor markets and migration session. Uh, we've got three talks today in this session, each of which is going to be 20 minutes uh, with 10 minutes for Q&A. If you do have any questions, please drop them in the Q&A box and uh, we'll ask you to unmute then to ask those questions at the end of the talks. Uh, please also note that this session is being recorded. Um, and therefore, with no further ado, I'd like to hand over to our first speaker, who is Augustin de Coulon uh, from King's Business School. Augustin, would you like to share your screen? Augustin? Uh, yes, yeah, someone else is sharing it. I think someone else needs to unshare. Yeah. Okay, great. All right. Is everyone seeing the shared screen? I assume yes. If not, just shout. So thank you very much. Um, that's uh, great to be able to present um, during this um, uh, conference at ESCO. So what we want to uh, do in this project is to try to introduce a new the use of a new administrative data uh, in the measure for the measurements of uh, immigration in the uk and in particular we think this uh, data has some potential at, for the measurement of immigration at local level, so local authority regions. So most of our work is on uh, local authority level. So we all know that the measurement of immigration is um, a difficult uh, task and uh, has been used a lot by policymakers in the past. Um, and targets have been uh, uh, announced and uh, consi consi consistently um, uh, overlooked and uh, failed. And um, those targets were based on measurement of immigration, which mostly relied on surveys, and uh, in particular, the uh, two that I listed here, the annual, annual, annual population survey, uh, which is really uh, an extension of the labor force survey and the international passenger survey, the IPS, which we will, will not use during this uh, work um, for reasons that we'll explain in a minute. So if you think of um, the APS, which is around 300,000 uh, indi individuals surveyed every year, and you divide that by the 348 local authority in the country, um, it, um, it will be okay for a lot of uh, assessments of a native population, but for uh, immigrants, it will become a very small size for a lot of local authorities. If you think you have around between 18 and 20,000 uh, immigrants interviewed in the uh, APS every year. So what do you do to uh, publish um, a figure on, on immigration? You simply wait, using a weight, those 18 to 20,000 immigrants and you, you get the number. So of course, the, the construction, of the weight is, is really a key in, in this process. And um, the smaller the numbers of people you are interviewing, uh, the, 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 the larger the importance of the weight being built uh, very precisely. So what we do here is we go very much away from this idea of measuring immigration from a reduced sample and then extrapolating to, to the larger population. We go the other way around. So we start from uh, uh, a, a, a sampling, which is the electoral register, which is the full population. Uh, and we try to uh, compare, to use it to measure immigration. So I think that's the first time this has been done. 
so of course uh, um, there are some limitations. We don't have access to uh, the uh, disaggregated electoral register. We only have access to published data by the Office for National Statistics and at local authority level. So we do graphical of comparison of the way we assess uh, uh, immigration in the electoral register. The way we do that is by focusing on immigrants from the European Union and, as I said just before, on the regional distribution of this uh, population. So a word of um, uh, caution on uh, definition first. We uh, are not able to use the inter internationally recognized uh, definition of immigration, which is that you are being born abroad and you um, and um, uh, and that you um, sorry that you are be being born abroad and that you have you have uh, spent for at least a year in the host country. We can't use that, of course, when we use the electoral register because the electoral register only records nationality. So what we do in the electoral register, we are we are. Uh, the electoral register is actually made of, some of you probably are filling regularly the electoral register, so um, I don't know if you see my screen uh, here, I'm, I'm showing you uh, some um, form that you're supposed to fill every year. So it's an annual canvas that starts around um, uh, the months of April, May, and with a cutoff date in December every year. So every year, uh, electoral register officers, that's uh, people employed by local authority, have got to uh, deliver to the local commission the size of the uh, of the register. And in there, um, you uh, can uh, you have the, the fact that European Union uh, migrants are allowed to register for vote, but they will only be able to vote for local election and until 2019 for European election. Uh, was before exiting the, the European Union, of course. And um, so uh, the, the ONS published two separate uh, versions of the electoral register. One that includes all uh, electoral uh, um, uh, electors that can vote to every election that include European Union, and another one then include only people allowed to vote for general election, and that's mostly British um, and uh, former Commonwealth um, uh, citizen of former Commonwealth countries, uh, to which you add Ireland and citizen from Ireland to so Irish um, and Cyprus, uh, Cypriot and and Maltese people. So we um, compare. Uh, most of our comparison is actually done on using the census 2011, um, but we use as well the APS uh, and we compare that to uh, the figure we get from the electoral register. So it said things about uh, def the definition. Uh, of course, we uh, use the same definition that we have uh, available in the ER. Uh, uh, in the APS and the census. So we use simply uh, foreign nationality. We don't have uh, the country of origin uh, and the nationality, uh, neither the year since migration in the, in the electoral register. So we can't use that. So the electoral register is an interesting um, um, a source of measurement, we think. Uh, we don't have the time to uh, detail uh, why, but uh, there is a legal um, um, requirement to fill it. Uh, you can be fine if you don't do it. The, the quote from Ronzos is quite uh, uh, tough uh, and really say that every asshole has got to register. Um, so what do we do? So we have got, uh, that's the data we're using. So I have said that. So what here you see on this graph, you see on the blue line, the numbers of electors uh, um, in, uh, in the electoral register that can vote for um, 
European and local election, and that include uh, EU uh, citizen. And in the red uh, smaller register, you've got uh, electors allowed to vote only for uh, general election. And our measure is simply the, the vertical distance for every year in our sample uh, that we uh, attribute as being EU citizen living in the lo those local authorities. So you see that this vertical distance is, uh, is growing quite a lot from 2004 onward, as we would, uh, we would expect. You see a big adjustment in both register uh, around the year 2014-15, uh, which is due to a change in the way the uh, electoral uh, register has been compiled. Uh, at this time. So what we um, uh, grew, uh, drew um, subsequently is simply uh, our measure calculated by the difference between the two uh, lines uh, that we showed earlier, which is our blue line here, which is our count of EU citizen in all local authority. And we compare it with a similar um, uh, figures obtained from the APS, and uh, we see that uh, the adjustments that was done in the measurement um, of the electoral register had some impact a bit more on our measures, uh, and we see that we observe a bit of a reduction post 2014 in the number of EU citizens that we measure in the electoral register in there. So we do the same for Wales. Now, uh, we still think those two curves uh, move quite uh, closely, at, especially until 2014. Uh, and um, we question whether the reduction is due to the fact um, in the electoral register that we lost a lot of uh, students from EU who previously were, for a lot of them, directly registered by the university in which the, they were uh, at uh, studying and after 2004 they had to do that individually so we do that we add the students in, in green here we see a bit of a correction but not uh, the whole thing so um, uh, what we wanted to focus on was the measure of uh, regional distribution so how does the regional distribution of uh, those uh, two measures the one uh, in the APS and the one in the um, electoral register. Uh, and uh, if we consider the year 2011, the census, because the census is probably the better, the best measure of uh, immigration. Uh, the, big, the problem, the drawback of the census, it's organized only once every 10 years. So there is one being organized at the moment, but obviously we won't be able to use it until a few, until probably to 2023 or four. Um, uh, but we can use the 2011, that's what we do. So we do, we, can, we, we, we make simple uh, rank experiment, rank correlation between the electoral register and the APS. I found that the um, correlation between the rank of those local authority is quite high, but it's the highest. Uh, between the electoral register and the census at 97. Um, uh, so that's, sorry, that's the Spearman run correlation. Uh, and we've got um, uh, a direct correlation here, which is around 9.96 all over. So you could see that on the graph, if you draw, um, for example, the APS on the uh, Y axis and the uh, electoral register on the, on the X axis, uh, you will see that um, the numbers that we observe in those two data sets uh, are well they fit uh, along a straight diagonal from the origin. Uh, if they were completely exactly the same, they would be perfectly aligned on this di diagonal. So we don't have time to see those descriptive graphs, but you see that there are some variation around the diagonal, of course. Um, so we have, we produce as well some distribution over time by looking at, of course, we know that immigration is a very regionally uh, selective um, um, uh, behavior. A lot of migrants settle in uh, only a few 
a local authority uh, for reason um, of network and uh, 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 easier assimilation in the labor market. So, and as well, availability of job in, 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 some, re in some region that attract uh, immigrants. So um, what we do, we simply look at the 50 uh, LA who's the highest count of, of, of EU citizen, and we compare that across data set. We do find quite a lot of stability in there. We calculate as well um, uh, indices of, um, of inequality, uh, and we do find that they, they, they do uh, um, are quite uh, close to each other. Uh, but we do find differences, and uh, okay, I don't have time, but actually we do find that. You've got example, five minutes, Augustine. Yes, that's, yeah, cool. Uh, with the Meran and the Pish measure, which are basically measures that, compared to the Gini coefficient, put more weight on a smaller uh, local authority or a larger local authority. We see a bit of difference, so that allows us to draw some interesting conclusion there, or, or whether the, the measurement varies along the distribution. Now, what we do uh, uh, with our estimation, we simply do what, we, what I described earlier. So we try to uh, uh, do a regression of the diagonal uh, where you've got on your y-axis the numbers of uh, EU citizens in the APS as we measure them, and on the x-axis the numbers of EU citizens in the electoral register. So uh, if they were perfectly aligned on diagonal, we, we, the alpha would be zero, the beta would be one, um, and that what we, uh, it wouldn't be useful to use the electoral register because it would simply mean that it's measuring exactly the same number as the APS. So what do we do? So we add, of course, uh, it's not the case, we know that, or we can expect that. So we add a regional uh, local authority uh, fixed effect dummies to see which one um, uh, depart more, uh, exceed or are below the, 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 the diagonal and do some adjustment for clustering. So that's what we do here. So we see quite straight away that the uh, constant is different from zero. The slope is different from one uh, when we simply do a regression uh, as you had just described. Uh, but we then do, uh, we adjust a bit um, by including LA dummies, including years dummies as well, and allowing for uh, the change in the way uh, citizen, uh, EU city, uh, sorry, um, every citizen has been recorded in the electoral register after 2014. So uh, it's uh, an adjustment similar to a structural break adjustment that we do here. And we do find that when we do that, uh, but L square is really high. Um, and, but as well, the slope is, big, uh, is much closer to one. It's actually indeed not significantly different from one at this point. Um, the, the constant is still quite away from uh, the origin, but um, yeah, uh, okay. What we do ultimately, uh, last two minutes, is to um, I try to infer some information from those LA dummies we've introduced here and say um, maybe helping the NS uh, or uh, 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 tell which local authority seems to be departing more uh, from uh, 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 with regard to figures uh, measurement of EU migrants in uh, comparison to the APS. And the way we do that, we simply extract those dummies uh, and we uh, uh, draw them there here on the kind of density just to see how they are distributed. And we regress them on the size of the population. So that the question we, we ask is, or we try to answer to address, is whether a larger local authority uh, have got uh, more of uh, deviation uh, yeah, in the measurement of EU citizen using the APS versus the electoral register. And we do find some evidence of this here. Right, I think I should conclude. I'm more or less on time. Um, 
maybe I just want to do my, I might leave that for the next, um, for the discussion. We, we have some plan to go to do a bit more and to use in particular the EU settlement scheme. So probably most of you are aware that EU citizens have been given right to settle in the country. And, um, uh, and this is an authorization you have to apply to the home office, but the data is shared with the ONS. So the ONS is down publishing every quarter the numbers of EU students, uh, sorry, EU uh, citizen getting uh, the settlements. And interestingly, uh, not getting the settlement, but getting a pre-settlement. And that would be for people from the European Union who arrived in the last five years. So that's a very interesting um, additional data source we, we, are, we are starting to use now. Right, yeah, so I think I should wrap up now. And okay, start. thank you, Augustine. Um, so there are no questions in the chat window in the Q&A. So to get things started, um, I've actually got a question for you, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, so I only found out yesterday from another talk in this session that the first two letters of somebody's national insurance number tell you when the national insurance number was issued. So that combined with your, their age, that could imply that someone's a migrant. Uh, and so I'm just thinking whether there's other sources of data that are currently not being used in the UK um, for tracking migrants and, and not only just seeing where they live, but also where they work. And I have in mind the annual survey of hours and earnings, which is based mm -hmm. on insurance numbers. But I'm just wondering if you'd thought about that or if anybody here is from ONS had thought about that in terms of sort of actually, because it's not in the data set, there's no marker in there for a migrant, but there could be. And it would allow you to track not only, because sorry, the ASH survey gives the postcode of the worker from the perspective of the employer, what they've told the employer the postcode is, or where they live, but it also gives you uh, where, the, where, the, where, the, where they're working. So I just yeah. thought, I thought it was an interesting idea. I don't know. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's very interesting. Actually, I, I was aware of that because my uh, colleague, uh, um, uh, office next door to me at King's is um, is is Brian Bell. Of course, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes, and he's um, he told me uh, that so he's the head of the um, uh, migration advisory uh, committee, and they were trying to access uh, precisely what you described. So the ash uh, with uh, a flag or simply a dummy indicating whether the person is, a, is an immigrant. And apparently it does exist, but so far they've not been successful at, at getting in. So, um, so yeah, I, I don't I, think it is available at the moment, but yeah, the, it does there's exist. A, there's, a, there's a group funded by the UK Research uh, Institute at the minute creating a new version of the ASH for research use. And I told them about it yesterday. They didn't know, but they're gonna ask ONS to drop a flag in there as well. Yeah, excellent, yeah. 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 We should probably all do that. <laughs> yeah, we should, all, we should all email. Yeah. Has anybody else got any questions? Take that as a no. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, so I'm not sure. Should we? Uh, do, 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 did you want to add anything else, Augustine? On, on um, rush the next steps there? Or? Yes, uh, so maybe just, just to follow up on what you just said. Yeah. Um, the, similarly here, there is more info information that is not being published. So for example, the, um, the EU, sorry, the nationality is recorded in the, um, by the electoral rural um, officers in the local authority. The, the, the form I have got here in front of my eyes for Wandsworth, for example, uh, say very clearly it's, you are um, required to fill the form and it allows the ERO to assess whether you are eligible to vote. Uh, and there you've got to put your nationality. So uh, uh, there must be somewhere uh, 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 a register of people who are living in local authority 
we, which have a nationality that does not allow them to be included in the local, uh, in the election register. So again, that sounds to me like a, a really useful source of data. Um, uh, especially given the electoral register, I don't know if you have been come across an electoral register knocking at your door. It, it's very active canvassing. Uh, you get um, a letter through the post. If you don't answer, then you've got uh, sometimes people trying to call you. Uh, and uh, so it's a very, very active canvassing and for good reasons, because a lot of the funding from uh, local authority is coming from uh, a, the count of the numbers of people living in their, in, in their, in their local authorities. So they've got a, a clear incentive to register as, so as, as, as closely and as correctly the numbers of people living in the, in the borough on the local authority as possible. So I think, yeah, but actually, I started this project by thinking uh, we'll see what we can do with this data. And the more I look at it, the more I think there is a real, real potential there. Yeah, um, so that's one I wanted to add. Uh, Sasha Talavera has his hand up. I think you're unmuted now. Sasha, do you want to ask you a question? I think the hand's gone down, so it might have been an accident. <laughs> right, okay. Okay, um, great, thank you, Augustine. Thanks. Um, so do we want, should we, uh, Toe, would you like to start sharing your slides and get ready? Um, yeah, sure. Um, can you see my screen now? It's taken a minute to load, but yeah, it's there now. Right. Um, shall I start now or shall we wait? In... I think we should maybe wait a minute or so because people have an expectation, you know, for 30 minutes and they might switch between sessions. Okay. We should really be doing this in the same office, Tor. You're only about 10 meters away from me. Yeah, we should. Yeah. Thanks. You're allowed on campus? Yes, we are. we are. We're allowed on campus, yeah. Oh, you're very lucky. Yeah. How long have you been allowed? Uh, since, since the start of September. Okay. So with the yeah. usual restriction and... Yeah. yeah. I mean, we, could, we could be in the same office, but we'd have to be pretty distant, yeah. Wearing the mask, yeah, cleaning yeah. your workspace before and after coming. And, yeah. Exactly, yeah. When, when do you start, Augustine? Do you like well, welcome week? Are you, you're not allowed yeah, to. We, we, yeah, we are in welcome week this and next week. Um, right. But we're, yeah, it's, it's getting slightly nerve wracking at the moment because our car, they've cards have not been activated yet or reactivated yet uh, so, so the teaching starts in 10 days so really i think now we need to open this campus really fast yeah. but it's not yet there it's apparently it's problem with water in the pipes which has been yeah great so would you like to start um yeah sure so good afternoon everyone, I'm Tho from University of Reading and today I'm going to present the joint work with my co-authors from National Bank of Ukraine and University of Birmingham and as usual the views here are of us, the authors, and do not reflect the views of National Bank of Ukraine. So um, what do we do in this paper? Actually we just want to provide new answers for the very old question of what is the link between wage and unemployment? 
And I think when I say wage and unemployment, one of the first things that could come into our mind could be the Phillips curve, which basically says that there is a trade off between wage inflation and unemployment. When unemployment rate goes up, inflation goes down and vice versa. However, Despite the fact that the Phillips curve is very popular and it has been being used by many central banks as the guidance for policy making, recent observations have raised the questions of whether or not the Phillips curve is irrelevant to the modern economy. The reason for it is because actually in many countries, especially in the US, after the recession, it seems like the Phillips curve is flattening. We can no longer observe the negative link between inflation and unemployment in the US anymore. Whereas in other countries like France or Italy, the negative link is still pretty much there. So the recent debate is pretty much about whether, whether or not the modern Phillips curve is still flat or is flat or it still has the negative slope. And if is this flattening, then what could be the reasons behind the flattening of the Phillips curve? Um, some studies have shown that, well, actually, the Phillips curve is not flattening. It's just that we ignore the uncalled inflation expectation. If one takes into account the inflation expectation in, in, examination, in, 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 um, in the examination of the Phillips curve, then we still observe it. Some others suggest that maybe the reason why we don't observe the, the negative slope of the Phillips curve is because most examinations are done using the aggregate data which do not take it, which do not have the do, which do not have the labor market hetero, heterogeneity which has the which has the important determinants of the wage dynamics or maybe it could be the case that the Phillips curve is not about the link between wage and unemployment, but it's just the shape of the country, like the case of Japan. As you can see from the picture here, the, the Phillips curve of Japan look exactly like the map of Japan and that's it. Then contributing to the debate of what is the link between wage and unemployment is the introduction of the wage curve. But different from the Phillips curve, the wage curve tries to link the level of wage instead of the wage inflation, the level of wage with unemployment. And what they say is that there is a negative link between the wage level and, and unemployment. And there have been a lot of empirical studies show evidence supporting the wage curve decision. But despite that fact, there are also a lot of criticisms about the wage curve model, and most of it are about the biases and mismeasurement, which I will talk into more detail later when we go into the analysis. So as I mentioned earlier, because of the ongoing debate of what is the link between wage and labor market conditions, what we try to do here is just to revisit this very old question, but using a new and unique data set of online job vacancies in Ukraine. Using this unique data set, we are able to examine the Phillips and the wage curve at different levels of disaggregation. And also, we are able to use an exogenous shock to the local labor market in our IB setting to, to investigate the wage curve. Just to give you a brief overview of what we do and what we find, first of all, we try to come up with an online wage index using our data and find that actually our online wage index is highly correlated with the official statistics. And then we move on to our analysis of the Phillips curve at a different level of disaggregation. And we find that at the country level, yes, it seems like the Phillips curve is flattening. It's not very clear. However, when we move from the country level to the disaggregated level of the wage index, like the wage index as the sectoral or occupational levels, we find that the existence of the Phillips curve becomes much more clearer. And finally, we conduct our analysis of the wage curve and we show the evidence of the negative link between the posted wage and unemployment. However, there is a large variation in the wage cyclicity when we take into account the difference across patients or across, uh, across occupations with different level of skin requirement. 
Oops, sorry. Now, um, as I mentioned earlier, our data is the online vacancy data, which we got directly from the OLS.UA, a leading online advertisement platform in Ukraine. And just like any other kind of online vacancy data, in our data, we can observe own information related to a job posting, such as the title, job location, description, salary, job type, and requirement of the job. But, but a unique thing in our data is that we also have the data about job seeker. Although we don't have the detailed CV of the job seekers, but we have information about how long the job seeker has been looking for a particular type of job or a job in particular occupations and for how long. And using this unique job seeker data, we can um, uh, we can make use of this job seeker data in our IB setting. Now, just a little bit more about our data. Um, we have, actually we have data from 2014 until June 2019, but because of the low coverage of the data in 2014 and 15, so we decided to drop the data in 2014 and 15 from the analysis. And because we are interested in examining the link between wage and unemployment, so we only keep vacancies, which are the full-time jobs, of a monthly salary and have the wages that was listed in the local currency. We also do some cleaning to make sure that we exclude all our liners from the analysis. After cleaning, we have the final sample of more than two, no, of more than 0.8 million vacancies belonging to 23 job categories for the analysis. And here, well, obviously, we don't really expect that the, the online, our data is, um, is, is, is presentative of the, whole UK, of the whole Ukrainian labor market. And in fact, what we have seen in our data is that most of the jobs listed in our data are from the very large and economically developed regions in Ukraine like Kyiv or Odessa. On average, the salary in Kyiv are much higher than the average salary in other regions, while the salaries in the, in the regions that is in the conflict zone or close to the conflict zones are much lower than the official average. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning, in the first part of our analysis, what we try to do is we try to, con to come up with an online wage index using our data. And what we did, we used a hedonic wage model where we regress the log of the posted wage for each vacancy on the dummy variable, which equals one if the date when the vacancy was posted on the website is in the current month and zero if it was posted in the previous month. And in this equation, we also control for different combination of face effect like categorical and regional face effect. So essentially, by estimating this model and obtain the estimated beta, our estimated beta here can be considered as the net of specific measures of the online wage index or online wage inflation. <coughs> and also, as I mentioned at the beginning, we try to do, uh, we try to examine the existence of the Phillips curve using different level of disaggregation. So in that sense, we also estimate our, this model at different levels of applications. Um, we obtain wage index at the country level, at the category region level, as well as at the occupation and region level. All of these will be used in the examination of the Phillips curve data. And in this figure, what I try to show here is that, as I said, the, our data cannot say for the whole labor market in Ukraine. However, by the simple comparison, we still observe that the online wage index obtained from our data is highly correlated with the official wage index. And actually, we had a correlation of 72%, which is not bad. So based on this kind of simple comparisons, we can, to some extent, we can be reassured and go ahead with our analysis and be reassured that 
whatever results we get from our analysis, to some extent, can have the practical implication for policy making. Now, uh, moving on to our Philip curve examination. So the model for, for estimating the Philip curve is very simple. On the left-hand side, we have the monthly wage inflation measures. On the right-hand side, we have the official unemployment rate and different types of control variables, such as the lack of the, of the inflation index or change in the exchange rate and monetary fixed effect. For the sake of comparison, at the country level, we use three different indicators of inflation. The first one is the headline inflation index. The second one is official wage inflation. And the third one is our online wage index obtained from our data. <coughs> and each of these index are estimated using both the nominal index and the one that we have adjusted for the inflation expectation. And what we observe here is that there is a little evidence of the existence of the Phillips curve. And actually, we can only observe the negative, significant, negative, significant and negative relationship between inflation and unemployment when we adjust for inflation expectations. Now, after that analysis, we move on and re-estimate the Phillips curve model. But this time, we use the wage index estimated as a, at the categorical level. <coughs> and what we observe here is, again, the Phillips curve is only observed when we adjust for inflation expectation, like in column three, sorry, in column two and four in this table. And both the side and the magnitude of the slope of the Phillips curve seem to be stronger compared to the one at the country level that I showed previously. And following that, um, following the, that estimation, we now re-estimate the Phillips curve using the wage index at the occupation and regional level. <coughs> and again, what we observe here is that we find the steeper slope of the Phillips curve when we use the wage index as this very detailed level of this aggregation. So what do actually we learn from all this analysis with different level of this aggregation? We see that the slope of the curve becomes deeper with the higher level of this aggregation, which confirms the importance of the heterogeneity in the examination of the Phillips curve and confirms that maybe it could be better if we use least aggregated data to examine the Phillips curve instead of using the aggregate wage index. And our results also confirm the importance of controlling for the inflation expectations in, in investigating the Phillips curve. <coughs> and then we move on to the final part of our analysis where we focus on the wage curve Again, the model is very simple. We regress the log of posted wage for each vacancy on the log of the unemployment rate, controlling for the quality of job description and the various fixed effects like month of year, year, day of week, category, and region fixed effect. But remember at the beginning, I said, uh, what I said was that there was a lot of empirical evidence supporting the wage curve model but there were also a lot of criticisms as well. And one of the most common and important criticisms of the wage curve is about endogeneity. So to address the concern about endogeneity, we use IV estimation in which the unemployment rate is the endogenous variable. And we use the number of vacancies to work abroad as the instrument. So the idea here is that if there is an increase in the number of working abroad vacancies, that would lead to a negative labor sh supply shock to the domestic labor market and hence the unemployment, local unemployment rate. However, the domestic firms are unlikely to reset their wages as a direct response to the increase in the number of working abroad vacancies. Our instrument variable here is measured at the region month level. 
The second criticism about the wedge curve is related to the concern that maybe the wedge curve is just a, mess, a misspecified labor supply curve. So to address this concern, we add in the wedge curve model, an indicator of monthly labor supply for a given job category region pair, which is measured as the ratio of one plus the number of job seekers to one plus the number of vacancies. And the idea here is that if the unemployment rate is just a mismeasured labor supply in indicator, then when we include this supply variable into the specification, the, co the estimation, the coefficients on unemployment should not be statistically significant anymore. Sorry, you've got five minutes. <laughs> yeah, sure. I will wrap up. <coughs> so what do we find when we do the analysis of the wage curve? We find that no matter what we do with our specification, whether we control for labor supply, whether we use the OLS estimator or we use two SOS estimator, we still observe the negative link between unemployment and the negative link between wage and unemployment. And then in the next step, we try to see whether or not the difference in across occupation um, the difference in the skin requirements across occupation matters with the, for the wage curve slope. And what we did, we, if we separate our sample into two groups. The first group is the occupation, the high skin occupations, which is the one that requires at least the college education. And the low skin occupations are the ones that do not require the college um, education in that requirement and then re-estimate our wage curve model on these two groups. And as you can see from this table, it seems like the, low, the wages of the low skin occupations are more cyclical compared to the wages of the high skin occupations. Why is this so? Uh, well, there's a number of reasons to explain the, um, these observations. One of, uh, one of the reasons is that Competition tends to be higher in the low skin segment of the labor market. Obviously, the high skin workers can compete with the low skin workers for the low skin jobs if necessary, but not the opposite. So in the case of a Thai labor market, it could be less costly for firms to raise wages of the low skin jobs compared to raising the wages of the high skin ones. And as a result, the low skin occupations wages are less rigid. And finally, we try to see whether there is any difference across regions in Ukraine in terms of the slope of the wage curve. So we re-estimate the wage curve model on four subsamples of four groups of regions in Ukraine. And what we observe here is that the wage in Western and Central Ukraine are more cyclical compared to the wages in Kyiv and Southeast regions, which can be explained by the geographical locations of these regions. Obviously, the Western and Central regions share borders with Central and Eastern European countries. And in recent years, there was a lot of changes in regulations that allow for the huge outflows of Ukrainian workers to go and work in the neighboring countries like Poland. <coughs> so for that reason, the, the labor market in Western and Central regions are much more cyclical. However, in the case of the Southeast regions, which um, originally and historically they had a very tight link with Russia in terms of labor outflows, that there was a lot of Ukrainian workers going from the Southeast regions to go and work in Russia. However, this outflow of workers have been negatively affected by the conflict between Russia and Ukraine and conflict in the east of Ukraine started in 2014. So what, what do we want to conclude from all of this analysis? We want to say that, um, well, actually, it's not the conf there is no conflict between the Phillips curve and the wage curve. Once we control for all different types of heterogeneity and control for different types of biases, then we can see that we can reconcile the Phillips curve and the wage curve. And it's been good 
and it's still a good idea to use the Phillips curve or even the wedge curve for policy making. However, one needs to be very careful and take into account on the potential bias to get better estimates of this, the slope of this curve. And maybe based on our analysis, the central banks can somehow take advantage of the new and rich stock labor market data like the online vacancies in the Phillips curve and wedge curve analysis for their um, policy research. Um, and I think that's it from me. Great, great, thank you. Um, so again, there are no questions in the Q&A yet. So I've got a couple of questions to kick things off. Tara, if that's okay. Yep. So um, I think you might be underselling this paper, right? Because actually you're, you're better than estimating the wage curve because what you're doing here is you're estimating the hiring wage curve, which is far more important for you know, macroeconomic theory and model, modeling in terms of you know, understanding what, what drives fluctuations in the labor market. Um, so yeah, that's a very good point. And that's what um, actually we are trying to do to improve the paper. So yes, you're right, because our data are for newly hired workers. So we are trying to see what else we can do or which way we can go to sell our paper along that line of, of, of literature as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, th I think that would be, be really good. Um, and then I, I also was also thinking, just in terms of bias and estimation, whether there is any more you can do to control for the composition of hiring over the cycle. Um, so, so, so in a paper that I worked on um, and what other people do is they tend to favor estimating things at the job level rather than at the worker level or the, the vacancy level because then you're able, if you estimate things at the level of a job, you're able to control for the endogeneity of the, the hiring volume of different types of jobs over the cycle in your, in your estimation. I was wondering if you were able to do that. Well, actually to some extent we did. Um, not exactly the same, but similar analysis when we um, where is when we estimate the Phillips curve using the occupation regional level of the um, of the wage index, and we actually use a self median or self mean approach. Right. So um, that's well based on what I read from the Phillips curve literature. One way they try to address the concern about the composition of job as um, different kind of um, the different composition of um, jobs in the data yeah. is yeah. to yeah. is to collapse the data to the cell, and each cell could be occupation region level or region level. That sort of analysis. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. That's that's your more robust estimate of the real wage response to the cycle. Once you do that. Yeah. Um. So yeah, to some extent, we did. Partly, we did it in the paper. Yep. Okay. Uh, does anybody else have any questions? Sorry. Could you, yeah, uh, could you address the correlation at the job level by simply correcting your standard error for clustering at the job level, the occupation level? That could um, be another way. Maybe you've oh. done that already. Oh, thank you. Yes, so we did try different level of clustering in the paper as well. But that, that wouldn't control for the endogeneity of the hiring volume. No. Yeah. And you can use weighted least squares as well or something. Um, well, we haven't tried that, but yeah, we can, we can think about the weighted least square. Thank you. Okay, so are there any other questions for Tori? So, so if not, I'll add a very geeky question or a very, very specific question or comment um, that I think your equation three on slide 12 might be better estimated um, uh, two-step and you get more conservative uh, standard errors. Uh, this one? Uh, I think, or maybe that one, yeah, maybe slide 21, yeah. yeah. Rather than clustering, um, you might want to estimate it with dummies for the, for the month and then do a two-step. 
to get more conservative standard errors. But I don't think that's going to affect your inference. It doesn't affect the estimates, it just affects the standard errors. Uh, sure. I think that would be what that would be what Angrist and Pishka would recommend or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yep, so you suggest that we should do it in two steps. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Right. Uh, I'm next, but I think again, because people might be switching between sessions, I'll give you a few minutes before I start. But I'll just load up my slides. Thank you very much, Tai. Um, should I stop sharing so you can I share? I think so, yeah. Thanks. So when do you start your teaching in our reading? Um, I think got a first tutorial on the 28th. Um, hi, Carl, you can start your session now. You can start okay. your session. Yeah, I was just waiting in case people are switching between, but that's okay. Okay, right. Uh, in that case, I will start. Okay, so this is a, a straightforward, uh, re very descriptive paper with uh, my co-author, Daniel Schaefer, who's at Johannes Kepler University, Linz. Uh, it's a paper which showcases a source of data in the UK that was um, that I mentioned earlier in the first uh, talk in this session um, that has been around for a long time, since the 70s, in, under different names. Um, but it's a really excellent source of data that's been, it's still in my view, even that's been around so long, quite underused by researchers because it's not in the most... Uh, attractive form uh, and it takes a lot of work uh, to actually dig into and understand before you can get it, get get, uh, get much many results that you have any confidence in out of it. Um, so this paper is about nominal wage adjustments. It's going to be addressing the classic question of are wages uh, downward rigid? Uh, and it's going to be using payroll data. Okay, so what do we do in this paper? So as I said, we're going to use uh, very high quality British payroll data to document a new set of facts, we think, about nominal wage changes. Uh, we think it's very high quality, certainly, and it has certain features which make it very attractive, even compared to other administrative data sets around the world. We're going to provide evidence as well um, at the end uh, through, the, through the study uh, against the notion that nominal wages cannot be cut. Uh, we're going to specifically dig into this payroll data from, uh, from the, in the ASH uh, to show the role of uh, the different pay components in, uh, in allowing wage flexibility. Um, we don't have much time to dig into all of that today. Um, and then we're going to show that the wage flexibility of new hires in particular, uh, so relevant to the last talk, we're going to show that the wage flexibility of new hires is not significantly different from that of existing workers. So the main focus of the paper is on existing workers and their nominal wage changes. But we've got to kind of say, well, does that actually matter in a kind of general uh, macro sense? And to justify, in our view, that it does matter, we're also going to look at uh, the flexibility of new higher wages in this paper as well uh, and link that to uh, existing workers' wages. Uh, and we think that our results, um, and because of the nature of the, uh, the ASH data set and what it allows us to dig into with regards to wage changes for, for workers, we think that it helps us to reconcile um, some very conflicting findings in the previous literature. Okay, so why do we care about this question? Um, it's good to always start with Keynes and go back to some uh, Econ 101. So Keynes asserted that workers simply refuse to accept cuts in the nominal wages, and that's what we refer to as downward nominal wage rigidity. As I'm sure we all know here, if we have that downward nominal wage rigidity in the labor market, it prevents the real value of wages from falling during a recession, and thus would lead to a plausible theory of cyclical unemployment. The actual true extent of downward nominal wage rigidity beyond the theory 
is, uh, is, is, is critical for a lot of important macroeconomic policy questions. Uh, not least uh, in the current environment where we have many developed countries with low inflation, um, not least is it really important in, in, with regards to the question, uh, should we have higher inflation? Uh, is, it, is, it, is downward nominal wage rigidity, if it's present, is it an argument for a positive inflation rate uh, to, in the words of uh, Tobin uh, and others who put it in similar terms, to grease the wheels of the labor market, to uh, cushion the labor market from, um, cushion, cushion the economy from large changes in unemployment uh, during recessions and over the business cycle. And then it's also critical um, with regards um, sort of modern uh, ways of modeling the macroeconomy uh, in DSG models and New Keynesian models, since those models uh, tend to actually point to uh, nominal wage rigidity, downward nominal wage rigidity, as being quite useful in those models at being able to match cyclical fluctuations. Um, so it features already uh, in macroeconomic policymaking through its use in these models. So despite um, its key role, the question of whether wages are actually downward rigid, despite that, you know, how key it is to policymaking, it's still actually surprisingly, very surprisingly, remains somewhat of an open question, uh, are wages really downward rigid? Uh, this is very surprising because, of course, it does, uh, this, this, this hypothesis, Keynes' initial hypothesis that do workers accept wage cuts is empirically testable. If downward nominal wage rigidity is pervasive in the labor market, if it's sufficiently there and present to cause job loss, um, then we would expect to see it among workers who stay employed in the same jobs. We would expect to see some evidence of it in, in the wage, wage, wage distribution, uh, the wage change distributions. Um, and if downward nominal wage rigidity is an issue out there in the labor market and it is causing uh, job loss, then we should expect to see a scarcity of nominal wage cuts and uh, a consequent, therefore, uh, abundance of wage freezes when we look at wage change distributions. Um, so, in theory, that all sounds like it should be quite easy to test. But the, uh, in the literature, uh, this is uh, very, very um, uh, unclear, or the, the conclusion of the literature is quite unclear. Um, and the main reason why there isn't a consensus view really yet on um, the extent of downward nominal wage rigidity is that the existing data sets that were used to assess for a couple of decades were not really well suited to the task. So uh, these slightly earlier literature used household survey data. Uh, these generally came back with, a, with an answer of very significant uh, nominal, downward nominal wage rigidity. But these uh, household surveys are plagued with response errors uh, in self-reported earnings and hours measures. Uh, and so generally they've been, uh, they're, they're quite easily easy for people who want to argue that might against downward nominal wage rigidity for their purposes and their theory and their models. It's quite easy to dismiss these household survey based uh, studies. In particular, uh, response error uh, and rounding in particular of workers' responses would generally bias uh, these previous studies towards finding evidence of lots of wage freezes, uh, whereas you might not find that if the wage, um, if it wasn't self-reported data and the wage had been recorded more accurately. Um, and then uh, more recently, people have looked for answers uh, to downward nominal wage rigidity, or how, how, how prevalent it is, uh, using payroll data and more administrative sources of data. Um, but these sources um, uh, still don't, uh, while these sources tend to find uh, far more, um, a greater prevalence of wage cuts and a far uh, uh, lower prevalence of wage freezes than the household survey data found, but generally payroll data normally only contain total earnings. Um, so it's such that you can't uh, necessarily get the unit of wages which matter for economic decision making. For instance, uh, even, even, even when these studies have the hours uh, of workers, they're still mixing into the earnings measures of pay where it's not clear whether it's a production uh, cost change uh, for a firm when a wage changes. Something like um, changes in uh, overtime or changes in um, meal break pay or car allowances. It's not clear whether 
um, their relevant measures of earnings for, for the question of downward normal wage rigidity and how it matters in the macro economy. So uh, we're going to kind of uh, overcome that challenge by using the annual survey of hours and earnings, which was designed uh, specifically to record uh, details of, uh, of employees' pay uh, and dig into these, uh, these, these different components of pay. Um, and uh, so, the, so the ASH, we're only going to use it since 2006, even though it's been running um, in various forms since the 70s. We only use it since 2006 because of data consistency reasons, and we want to be very confident that what we're measuring year to year um, for these, these workers is, you know, robust and accurate wage changes. So we're only going to focus on this particular uh, 2006 to 2018 period. The ASH, if you're not aware, it's a panel, a 1% random sample approximately with some non-response in there as well. So it's a random sample-ish of income tax paying employees in the UK. Um, and there's no attrition from the sampling frame of that panel, which is quite useful. And then it's specifically been designed uh, and improved over the years to provide accurate measures of the different components of pay. So we're going to be able to uh, look at the contributions to wage changes and wage flexibility of overtime, shift pay, incentive pay, and even other pay. Um, and the example I put there is meal allowances, but that would include anything else which appears on the payroll, which is not the other components. And then vitally importantly, uh, in our view, relative to um, other uh, payroll and administrative data sets is that we can actually identify job stayers. So we can actually see in the ash because there's a marker and because firms report the occupation of their workers uh, and, and they're specifically asked in the ash, did this worker work in the same exact job and do the same duties as the year before? Meaning that we're able to focus on job stairs and not just firm stairs. Um, that's important because for, a question of, for the question of is there downward nominal wage rigidity, uh, Oh, I, I, there's no reason to be looking at workers who change their jobs or their occupations, because why would we expect there to be any downward norm and wage rigidity issues there for those workers? Um, it's a large sample, so we have uh, up to 100,000 observations per year in this sample period. And it also has uh, several other benefits uh, relative to these other data sets that have been used previously for this question. It's more reliable than household surveys. We're going to have the hours. We also know um, who is hourly and non-hourly paid, which is very unusual, and that's, that's that I don't think anybody, any of the other data sets of where this has been studied actually has that information. And then we have more detailed pay components than the typical um, payroll data that's been recently used in several studies in the US uh, and compared to previous UK studies. Uh, and we also have good hours worked, and unlike um, paper, uh, a paper in the US using administrative payroll data recently by Grigsby et al., uh, it's also representative. Okay. Right, so the data. What measure, uh, what measure of wages do we actually focus on? Because we, ha we, we have the, the benefit with the ash and the, and the kind of, um, we have the, uh, the luxury, if you like, of having several measures. So we can see uh, the basic wage, and that is basic pay, uh, which is all regular pay that a worker receives on the payroll before they add in anything extra such as overtime, supplementary pay for bank holidays, uh, meal allowances, et cetera. Uh, and then we're just going to be able to divide that by a measure of basic hours worked that the employer reports uh, to, to derive a basic wage measure. We also have earnings per hour where we, we add in these other measures of pay, uh, 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 but might necessarily still want to exclude overtime because overtime hours we do know and we can exclude the overtime hours worked. And then, as I alluded to earlier, uh, we have another measurement measure of pay, which is quite unusual um, uh, in, in any payroll or administrative data sets, which is we actually have the hourly pay rate of the workers, because the, the ASH asks the employer, is this worker paid by the hour? And if so, what were they paid for that hour? And so for about a third of the workers in the UK, they are paid by the hour, and the ASH tells us uh, what that hourly pay rate is. Okay, so, um, oh, sorry, just, just go scroll back. I think it's important to actually say at this point, we're not going to put our hat in the ring at all with regards which of these pay measures are the right ones to look at uh, when asking the question, question of whether there's downward nominal wage rigidity. Um, 
that's because it largely will depend on the question you're asking or the model that you're putting together. So if you were just interested in whether labor costs for employers are generally flexible or not, then it might be that you want to look at the earnings per hour. But there are other contexts and models where you might want to focus on basic wages. So abstracting from certain measures of pay where it's not obvious whether workers welcome those changes in pay or not. Such as workers might actually welcome reductions in overtime or reductions in, uh, in uh, nighttime working at shift premiums. Okay, so what, what, what do we find? So this is the most comparable, uh, this, this distribution here, the, uh, this is a distribution of the wage changes in ASH uh, pooled over the years that we study. This is the most comparable to the previous studies in the UK. So this is just the year to year changes in log earnings per hour, excluding overtime. So including all the other measures of pay, except overtime. Uh, on the Y axis, we've got the share of job stayers, individuals who stayed in the exact same job from year to year. Uh, and we're plotting two bars, uh, two, two comparable bars, uh, sets of bars, one for 2012-13 and one for before the Great Recession 2006-07. Each bar plots the proportion of job stairs with that, uh, that band of uh, wage change. And then we've got uh, a, a band at the exact, uh, at the center here, which, is, which plots the number of exact zeros. Um, wage changes, which are wage freezes in the data. Year to year, these workers had no change in their wage. What you can see in this uh, figure is that, uh, as, as other people have found before, actually wage cuts are fairly frequent. Okay, so adding up what's to the left of the wage freeze, about 20%, about 20 of workers in the UK appear to have their earnings cut from year to year. Uh, rising and very much not in line with the idea that workers don't necessarily accept wage cuts. Um, just to drill into that data and show you kind of how it varies over time, um, you have, uh, as I said, you have this um, uh, generally over time, even before the Great Recession, after, but even during, this generally quite high prevalence of wage cuts or earnings per hour cuts in the data but also you have some spike, small spike in earnings per hour freezes as well, which you know, as you'd expect increase during the recession. Okay, um, so moving beyond what people have looked at before, then we drill into and compare here in this, hist in this histogram, um, uh, the distribution of wage changes uh, for earnings per hour in the lighter gray bars versus the basic wages. This is the basic wage, uh, the basic rate of pay that, that workers generally receive without all the supplements and other things that are going on in their pay packet. And what you then find when you drill into the basic wage is if we focus on the spike at the center, you will find um, a, a generally slightly higher prevalence of wage freezes, implying a greater prevalence of downward nominal wage rigidity in the UK labor market. But even in basic wages, you'll still observe a relatively large frequency of wage cuts uh, from year to year as well. Uh, and what we find in the paper, which we drill into, which I'm not going to drill into in great deal uh, detail here for the sake of time, is that um, the other components of pay, the difference between earnings per hour and the basic wage rates, are all contributing to this extra flexibility in, in wages and labor costs that firms can enjoy. Um, in particular, actually, or in particular, actually, the, uh, the component of pay, which um, generates quite a lot of extra flexibility for firms, apparently, is the other pay component. Um, also, overtime does provide a lot of flexibility as well. It seems for firms, uh, incentive pay, not so much. So then in the paper, we move on uh, to focus on this kind of unique measure amongst payroll and uh, administrative data sources, which is the actual hourly pay rate for workers who are paid by the hour. So in this, uh, in this picture, we're plotting bars for only the workers who are paid by the hour, which is a very select sample of the labor force um, who are in these hourly paid jobs. And we're comparing here with the lightest gray bars, uh, their earnings per hour. And then the medium gray bars, uh, if you can pick them up, which are the basic wages. And then with the dark gray bars, it's their hourly pay rate change and the distribution of those. So what we're finding then is for the very same workers pooled, this, sorry, this is pooled again uh, for uh, over a million observations uh, since 2006. 
what we're finding is this actually once we look at the hourly pay rate for these amongst these same workers we're finding these much higher a much higher spike uh, at zero wage change from year to year implying that workers hourly pay rates appear to show much more evidence of uh, downward nominal wage rigidity which is consistent and much closer to what the, what um, researchers found when they looked at household survey based studies um, but, work, but researchers since haven't generally not been able to look at when they've looked at payroll and administrative data. Um, but even for these workers, it's important to realize that even though it looks like they're not having uh, many wage cuts, and so there would be some kind of suggestion of downward nominal wage rigidity, firms, it appears, can still cut these workers' pay and their, their user cost of labor, uh, uh, their, 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 their cost of labor. Because these workers still, even though they're hourly paid workers, they still have relatively uh, frequent cuts in their earnings per hour and their basic wages. And just to point out, you might be thinking why if these workers are paid by the hour and you have accurate me measure of basic wages and also hours worked for these workers, why are we finding such a big difference between um, the distribution of wage changes for uh, hourly pay rates versus basic wage rates? And the reason is simply measurement error. Uh, and in the paper, we go into great detail about the measurement error in the ASH, uh, which is being induced, a lot of it, by how the different variables available to researchers are being derived uh, from the surveys uh, and the data actually collected by ONS. Okay, uh, in the paper, we drill into a lot of heterogeneity in this. Uh, we look at different types of firms, different types of workers. Uh, unions, etc. We look at um, uh, different size of firms. This spike at zero is much, much higher for small firms in terms of uh, wage freezes. We also look at state dependent wage, wage setting by considering firms which are growing or shrinking or different stages of the business cycle. Um, but for the sake of uh, uh, brevity here, I'll leave that uh, for you to explore if you're interested by looking into the paper. So this is all great in a sense that we've been able to uh, dig into and create a lot of new facts for work uh, for researchers and policymakers who are interested in whether wages are rigid. Um, but it's uh, but it's kind of um, uh, the overriding question uh, would also be does this does this actually matter? Uh, because this is just a study of spot wages, and since Keynes, our understanding of labour markets has evolved quite a lot. And in particular, we now understand and generally uh, most models feature the fact that it's not the spot wage which really matters uh, for, for, uh, for decision making of firms hiring and firing. It's the present discounted value of wages, current and future, over the entire expected duration of a worker firm match and not necessarily the spot wage. So our study is based on spot wages. So, you know, an argument could be that this doesn't matter. Now, no, downward nominal wage rigidity doesn't matter a lot because it doesn't affect uh, the long run present value of a wage in a worker firm match. Um, it's also true that we focused on job stair wages, but most models and most theories suggest that uh, the key determinant of employment fluctuations is hiring wage, not the job stair wage. So why does a study, why might a study of spot wages or our study of spot wages still matter uh, for uh, macroeconomic questions? Uh, one theory that we like and we focus on is that if the wages and the incumbents and new hires within firms are linked through internal pay structures, then it's the case that rigidity and in incumbent, incumbent workers' nominal wages can still affect unemployment fluctuations through those links in internal pay structures. Um, uh, so, so, uh, so we're going to investigate, uh, we add into the paper, we, we add an investigation of this, which links to some, some, of, some stuff that we previously looked at as well, and we ask effectively, uh, are, can new hires uh, un undercut existing workers' wages? Because if they can, then a study of spot wages and all this downward nominal wage rigidity that we find uh, might not matter very much at all. Okay. I so thought a minute, girl. Yeah, that's fine. Thank you. So do spot wages matter? matter? So to explore this, we use the ASH again. Uh, we regress the log wages of worker I in firm J in region R and year T. Uh, on a dummy for the worker firm match uh, um, to control for the cyclical match quality. And then we're extracting these beta uh, coefficients uh, for incumbents and new hires. We've got a bunch of controls in there as well. And then we take these beta coefficients and in the second step regression, we're going to regress them on the unemployment rate. And what we're basically interested in here is that within a worker firm match, 
using this regional variation in unemployment rates, does it appear like as though um, uh, the cyclicality of new hire and incumbent wages in the ash uh, are approximately the same or not different, which would be suggestive, uh, if you like, that new hires, uh, new hire wages don't undercut incumbent wages and therefore also suggestive of internal pay structures, which link spot wages and uh, hiring wages. Uh, and what we find, uh, this is the estimated elasticities uh, of that regression. Looking at the final column, which is the important one, we find uh, that there's no significant difference in the cyclical response of incumbents and new higher wages, uh, implying that uh, uh, within these job matches, uh, the new hires can't in undercut incumbents. Okay, so in conclusion, very quickly, uh, the wage flexibility of new hires, uh, we don't think is, uh, well, we find is not significantly different from that of existing workers. We also find in this paper that the hourly pay rates of hourly workers show very strong signs of downward nominal wage rigidity consistent with the survey based evidence, the household survey based evidence of, of decades ago, uh, but without any concerns for the reporting errors. Uh, firms use other pay components quite a lot and a lot more than you might think to overcome nominal wage rigidity it appears, uh, salaried workers experience frequent cuts in their basic wages. Uh, and in conclusion, the often invoked assumption that nominal wages cannot be cut does not seem to be particularly valid when you drill into uh, good wage data. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Cal. Uh, excellent. Do you have any question? So let me start me with one question. Um, so do we have do you have measure of um, our um, working hours in the yes. ash? Yes. So the basic hours and the overtime hours. So if you look, if you could you be able to look at adjustment on hours for incumbents versus uh, newcomers? Yeah. So we did that in another paper uh, ah. that we, we published last year. Uh, and we found that uh, new hire hours are particularly sensitive. So incumbent hours are fairly rigid uh, within the same job. So we used within job variation. We compared, we did this at a job level analysis within the ASH. Uh, and we found that hiring hours are particularly, particularly sensitive. It appears a, a way in which firms do adjust um, over the business cycle, but incumbent hours are rigid. So, so while hiring wages and job stair wages seem to track each other pretty well over the cycle, real wages, um, the hours don't within the same set of jobs. Hiring hours are very flexible in the UK. And do you find evidence of, of that happening differently across more unionized sectors or less unionized sectors? So we did look into the heterogeneity by union um, in terms of the nominal wage changes. Uh, and, uh, we did find that there was a suggestion of slightly more rigidity in unionized sectors, sectors cover, uh, jobs covered by a collective agreement. Um, but still, you still find the same, uh, you still find a lot of way, uh, earnings cuts and basic wage cuts. And in the paper, we did drill in as well uh, to the weekly wages as well, not just so abstracting from the hours. The ASH tells you if workers are paid at a weekly frequency. So you can focus on uh, weekly wages for workers who are paid by the week. And we find very similar levels of um, uh, year to year wage cuts and similar levels of freezes at the weekly level for workers who are actually paid by the week. Mm. Yes, talking about that, I was surprised when you were saying that. Um, it's one of the few studies that record people paid by the hour were because I, th I think the a LFS has one, hasn't he? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. In terms of um, sort of administrative or I see. They, so, so the, so those studies generally will be dismissed out of hand these days and they'll be dismissed out of hand by uh, the people who argue that wages are very, uh, uh, I think Jennifer Smith had a paper in 2000 using the uh, BHPS. 
massive pay slip. And the differences in uh, wage response uh, for workers who check their pay slip versus didn't were quite severe. Yeah. Implying that workers yeah. were doing a lot of rounding, mm. uh, which was driving a lot of the results on wage rigidity that, from the previous literature. Interesting. We got any question from the the audience, the attendants, the silence audience. Of course, what would be interesting, of course, if you get this um, identifier for immigrants, is that mm -hmm. you're gonna get, be able to check that. Um, very for yeah occupation which have a lot of immigrants and yeah and then the ash of course contains brilliant data on geography which yes. is so it contains the workplace geography and the the, the 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 home geography it contains the workers home address um and this is accessible without too much difficulties or you have to be an ons approved researcher and have the project oh, really? so it's through the I uk data, it's through the uk data service because of the geography element yeah Okay, so um, that sounds quite easy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've always wanted to look at things like travel to work and stuff and all sorts of yeah. things. But it's, it's been very understudied, the ash. Yes, for a reason I don't really understand. There's those just, a few papers by Richard Deakins, remember in the uh, early 2000s? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. He was, he was my Viva uh, examiner. Oh, uh, yes, a good friend. Yes, we were colleagues at Queen Mary. Um, and at the time, of course, it was called the NES, wasn't it? Yeah. The new earning server has then changed the name. It's only recently that you're able to see the firm identifier as well in the data set. Right, yes, yes. I suspect, yeah. Okay, should we conclude? Is that done, I think? I think so, yes.